Straightforward, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's not, it's not too many places to get stuck. Six will be more like uh, on features and data, uh, and then the only big item remaining as a homework issue is the super vector machines homework. So that one will have to uh, see exactly how much work can we put in there. I really have something in homework eight that I absolutely need to do. So even if we don't do everything, we got to get to that item in homework eight, which is Kenya and his neighbors. It's, a, it's an absolutely critical thing that you guys have to do. So we might shrink a little bit of support vector machine homework to make space for everything remaining, but that's my plan. So as I said in the very, very first class, the main issue in this course, it's not going to be the ability to get points and, and scores for the homework. Everybody can get it done with enough resources and time, <laughs> right? It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not like, it's not like in a regular course where you submit your homework and then you get uh, you know so many points and based on that points, it just happens. If you try hard enough, you can do all those homeworks, right? Because we have office hours every day and you can come in enough times until you figure it out. The issue here, it's gonna be whether you finish or not. That you have the time to finish those homeworks. So I had in previous years, um, no uh, shame for me to say it, people who work to finish at the end 40 hours a week for this class. And they got an A, and they didn't do anything else for the last three weeks. I I'm not saying you should do that. <laughs> I'm saying the issue is not going to be that you are not smart enough or qualified enough or trained enough to get it done. The issue is going to be how much time do you need to sink in to get an A. Because if you really want it, you can get it. Okay. Uh, more bad news. There will be an exam on a Saturday. I think so. That is April 20th. How about that? Is that, is that a good idea? Not the exam. Whether it's, it's good to put it on Saturday. Here's my thinking, okay, about that. This is a Saturday. Market doesn't want to write down the exam. Uh, it's not scheduled yet, because the school is working on it. But on a Saturday, it would be much easier to schedule. After this Saturday, after this weekend, there is the exam week. And the exam week would be really tough to schedule exams, because it's, this is more classes, big classes, everybody's roaming around. We can have it on Monday instead of Saturday. For me, it's the same thing to have it Saturday or Monday or Tuesday, no difference. I'm not leaving anywhere. But many of you ask me, when can I leave, right? Um, uh, preparation for this exam, if you have other exams in the exam week, which is again the week after this, starting on 22, that's the exam week. I don't think you need to prepare for this exam. Yet my thinking for this exam is that it doesn't really matter where it is, Saturday or Monday or Tuesday or Friday because the nature of this exam is that it's pretty much like a homework. There's not much preparation you need. You're going to show up with your laptop. There'll be two problems similar to the ones in the homework with some setup. I have a data set. I'm running regression. I observe the following phenomena. What should I do? So it's not like recapping all those notes. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help the map. It's, it has to do with how much have you accumulated over the term. You still have access to internet, so you can Google everything, and you can 
you know, you have to be honest, like in the homework, if you if you copy paste some code or run something from the internet, you can, uh, you know, you have to say it. There will also be specific guidelines, you know, what, what you can do and what you cannot do. Certainly there's no collaboration between people. Question? Yeah. Can we use our prior homeworks? Yes. Yeah. So you can use all the code you have from prior homeworks and even libraries from the internet if you say, you, you should ask during the exam, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm intending to use some library from Sky to Learn. Can I do that? If it's not clear. Right? So I don't intend this exam to be any more uh, different than a homework. It's the same kind of thing. You have a machine learning problem and you're trying to solve it. It's going to be easier because it's a five hour exam. The homework takes two weeks to do. You, you, you can't get the same problem in class. Right? So in some sense, it will be a little bit similar with an interview where you get a problem and you try to solve it and you, 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 you attack it in certain ways. Uh, the techniques you're gonna need are not gonna be creative. You're not gonna discover a new machine learning algorithm during the exam. It's gonna be some of the ones we did in class, okay? And it's certainly doable within the time span. The problem itself won't be hard. It won't take long to run it, for example, if it's a decision tree or something like this. That's my intention. And uh, I'm asking you guys if Saturday, April 20 is okay, or if you really want to do it in the exam week. Again, I don't think you need extra preparation. The real preparation for this exam, guess what it is? Doing the homework. <laughs> That's the thing. If you do all these eight homeworks and you put the effort and you do the extra credits and you run it on data sets and you came to office hours, that's the preparation for this exam. Spending the night before reading all the notes, I don't think it will help, right? So in that sense, I think it's better to have it on Saturday, April 20th, if the Cory College can schedule it that way because you need a, a room with a lot of power outlets. It can't be a regular classroom. Um, then it gives you the next week to either go on vacation or to prepare for your other exam that might actually need two, three days of readings or, or, or I don't know, tutoring or whatever it is. So um, I can ask a show of hands, but how about we assume this is what's gonna happen unless you guys, uh, uh, why don't you write me an email if you have a problem with this thing? You know, say, uh, it, if it doesn't work for enough people, if it doesn't work for one person, I'll, I'll deal with that person separately. But if it doesn't work for half a class, then we can schedule it during exam week, Monday or Tuesday. Then we, we, can, we can do that as well. And so the, again, the other thing is if we do it on Saturday and spend some time, say Sunday and Monday, grading it and then discussing with you, gives us more time to discuss with you the, the, the exam and the grading situation. And then the people who want to leave early by the 23rd or so, they can leave. OK. Uh, will it be stretched out time and summer present the five months or will it be like the homework? We'll be like, not like the homework, like the homework. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't have a week you know, later. But some people are starting homework four right now, so that, that, that's can't be. But it will be loose within that time frame. We say five hours, if people need another, you know, say a few minutes to finish, half an hour, that's okay. I, I don't intend to have a very, very strict deadline. Like in the homework, I'm looking for people making progress on those problems, even if they don't, don't finish you know, the problem in the exam, discovering the issue and attack it in a certain way, figure out I need a different regularization, I need a different algorithm, I'm gonna do, whether, what, what is the, the problem and how I intend to solve it. <coughs> That's fine, so we can be a little loose on that. Uh, like with the homeworks, I have to figure out if there's something I have to do for undergraduates. Again, it might be some things graduate only and something just undergrads. That's a university guideline that I may need to do something lower from the undergraduates in, in, in that case. Okay. I don't know what it is yet. Five homeworks? No, 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 that's <laughs> not gonna be. I mean in the exam. All right. Okay, so are we happy or unhappy about this? Unhappy. Unhappy? Yeah, yeah. just know what's in. Homeworks only. They taught us all the stuff we need to know. You said the best way to study is doing homework. Right, so it's true. The, the right way to study is doing homeworks. You're not going to learn anything during the exam. The exam purpose is for evaluation purposes because we have this policy of customer service where everyone can get an A. The college has raised the issue. They like this approach. The dean and everybody, they really like the fact that the office hours are really helping rather than grading. 
you know, may, most TAs spend a lot of time grading papers at home, which is okay for grading, but not useful for the students. In this class, the TAs spend 90% of their time dealing with your code, so it's it direct help. But the end result is the, the evaluation, you know, maybe too many people get into high grade or something. That's not gonna happen, but for the <laughs> avoiding that, that sort of for debate, uh, we have this exam, which is like the homework. If you do the homework, you should be fine with the exam. Uh, all right, so what do we have to do now? Here's the plan. We need to finish boosting uh, and ranking. That's one item. Uh, two, I want to talk a little bit about more about homework five. Three, I want to start a new chapter which is features. That's kind of our plan, um, and then um, th this has few bullets in it. That that that's uh, the next chapter. What we're gonna do? So kind of that's like finishing up what we have. The features and margins are our next thing with the homework. That's homework six, um, and that will take us next week too. So we're gonna start today, and that's what we're gonna do next week. And that's uh, like I said. I think homework six is not. So bad at all. We have there like I don't know nine days. I think homework six can be done in two days of intensive effort. But then after that, we have support vector machines, which is a massive conceptual problem. And support vector machines are understanding how they work. It's much more difficult than everything we've done in this class so far. Just the conceptual part. So everything we've done is literally simple. It can be summarized in an elevator pitch within the floors. What is boosting? Well, add up a bunch of trees together, right? What is naive base? Estimate each feature separately, make a product, right? What is regression? Well, that's a line that separates the plus and minus and, and has a coefficient for each feature. We can't do that with support vector machines. There's no elevator pitch that works that easily, okay? So that's uh, gonna be a little trick. Can I ask a question about active learning? Sure. So, uh, so we said that when we pick next three percent of trained data sets, we choose the points which are close to the line. If it's the so if it, the separating thing is line, but so here we assume that we're using some linear separation. I don't know, let's say some linear classification. But if it is neural network or if it is decision tree, can we still do active learning? Right. Right. Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, so there's multiple answers to that problem. Uh -huh. One is related to the fact that many non-linear classifiers, uh -huh. support vector machines, uh -huh. are actually linear in a different space. Uh -huh. So there's a change of topology of the space. We're gonna teach support vector machines, not next week, the week after. Uh -huh. We're gonna think of it as a linear classifier. Uh -huh. But we're gonna say, the linear classifier, if it's in a magic new space of features, not in the original space. So the original space of features is the X data matrix, right? Suppose I wanna do, I apply the whole SVM technology just in a different space. That will make it linear in that new space, but it'll be non-linear in the original space. And that's how I've got now, I work with a linear classifier for the math purposes, but if you look at the feature space, the, the separation surface is very non-linear. That requires the introduction of something called kernels. But that's one answer. Another answer to your problem is this. We're gonna talk about margins that impl implicitly means confidence. And confidence, we can think of it as a difference from the line or from the classification. Whether it's a line or a probability threshold or some other things, margin will indicate kind of how sure I am I'm on the right side of things. Mm -hmm. So by margin, uh, may maybe we should, uh, I'm gonna look at that today, right? I have this line, this is a small margin whether it's a correct or incorrect, it's close to the line. Uh -huh. And this is a big one. Uh -huh. Distance here. That's the distance here. So if I define such a concept, I may have to adapt it to my classifier. Uh -huh. Then margins can help me analyze 
what is close, what is not close. Also, if I have probabilistic classifiers, like all the genetic models we've done, uh -huh. if I trust those probabilities, uh -huh. I made this discussion before with fake probabilities versus real probabilities. You know, logistic regression process a number between zero and one, right? And we say, that's a probability, but it's fake. You know, it's not really a chance of something happening, right? But if you trust those probabilities, you can look at that probability to tell what's your confidence, right? If it's close to 50-50, then that will be an active learning point, right? Be something close to, I'm confused, I don't know it's a plus or minus. My classifier is not sure. Yes. So, Professor, even if my classifier is a neural network, even if it's decision tree, I can still use margin. Some other as long as there. I have a notion of confidence. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Based on that, I could tell whether some point it's between the classes, it's really, I'm not sure what to do or whether I'm very sure what to do with it. I think it's easiest to visualize with lines, right? Closer to the line or not. But the same concept can apply whether I have probabilities or non-linear classifier, as long as I, I'm able to define this confidence. I think. By the way, this is very important in a lot of machine learning. The classification, of course, is the basic tool that we have. And that was the focus of machine learning for at least 40 years. How do you develop better classification algorithms? But the recent machine learning and the recent industry problems are very related to things like, are your probabilities correct? When you say something is sick with logistic regression outcome 80%, what does 80% actually mean? Right? I mean, I would like to, that to be a real probability, and I talked about this at least three times before. I would like to say 80% means that if I look at 100 people all having the chance of being sick 80%, if 80% is correct, it's a true probability, what should happen? 80 of these 100 should be actually sick. right? If, if I say it's 80% chance, I can't judge for one person, because one person is either sick or not sick, but I can look at many people with 80% chance, and if roughly 80% of them are sick, then I call that a true probability. It's really 80%, it's the indication of something to happen with chance, 80%. But of course, logistic regression, for example, doesn't have a naive base or any of these methods. They don't have that kind of promise. They're going to give a number between 0 and 1, but there's no guarantee that that number actually corresponds to a true probability. So that's a big issue in the industry right now, today. A lot of focus on machine learning calibration, how to make these probabilities correct. Another big focus is this margin. Like, uh, even if margin doesn't mean something probabilistic, right? Big or small, but big means what? We, we don't know yet what it means. Uh, there is an advantage, in, even if I classify everything correct, right? Suppose I run a validation set or a cross-validation, and I've got all my classes on the right side, and all the minuses on the right side. 100% accuracy, right? right? It's still a point in keep training my classifier, my regression, my decision tree, my naive base. Even though I have 100% accuracy, the point in here being, of course I like the 100% accuracy, especially if that relates to the testing error, not, not overfitting, but I'm really having a simple, low complexity classifier getting me a good result. I test on validation data, very good result. Most people say like, why don't you stop right now, right? Because you, you've done it gives you the right thing. Here's my point. I would like this line to be here, not there. In other words, even though this line has 100% accuracy, I like this line much better. It's in the middle. This line has a problem that has very big margins one way, but very small margin this way. At least intuitively, it's easy to find a point of plus that might be here and I can make a mistake. But this line, being more in the middle, has margins both sides, decent margins, AKA uh, large error margins. I mean, points that are going in here or here, this is minus, this is pluses, I'm still getting them correct, right? So I, I don't wanna make this just for lines. All I'm saying is, if I get 100% accuracy, and that's not overfitting, it's still a point in keep updating my classifier if I can improve the margin 
aka my confidence. Do you always want to put it right in the middle, or based on the data, is it better to like put it closer to one side? That depends on the loss that I define. The square loss will put it in the middle. <coughs> SVM has a different loss. So depending on the loss function that you have, you remember that J, how do you measure how good the line is? Uh, that dictates what do you mean by the mean. It's always the middle conceptually, but what is the middle, right? The square loss measures the, the distance between the predictions and the, and the line, right? So then that loss, it's more susceptible to outliers. Uh, something far away will push the line. But I can define another loss when points far away don't push the line, and then I define effectively a different mean. All losses will have this property. It's better to fit somehow in the middle, even though you don't improve performance. Because you know you do gradient descent, or you do rounds of boosting, training more trees, right? Any method that's iterative and keeps keeps making progress. At some point, even if I get training accuracy 100%, validation accuracy 100%, there is a reason to keep going. That is improving this confidence. Okay. How will margins be applied to something like Gaussian? Uh, Gaussian is a model fitting problem. So we don't have, mar margin supply is much better. We can think about that philosophically outside the class. But margins are very related to discriminative algorithms, right? Discriminative algorithms, they have a job of separating sick versus healthy. Blue versus red, spam versus not spam. So discriminative means finding a separation between the two classes. Then the margin is well defined. The margin means, well, you find a separation, but how much is on each side of it, how much confidence they have. That's why I don't think this means translates directly into a generative algorithm that models the data, but we can think about what confidence means in there, right? I think you can have a notion of, okay, I have two Gaussians, that's a plus Gaussian, and I have a minus Gaussian, and now if I get a point, there is a probability to come from the plus side, and there is a probability to come, sorry, that's a minus side, the plus side, and the margin has to do, I have a probability to come from the plus side, the probability to come from the minus side. The more these probability are close, the less confidence I have. And the more they are far away, the more I am convinced it's, it's one of them, right? So I think we can expand this concept. Not, it's not literally what I mean by margin in terms of separation. All right. So uh, I want to do this today, but I would like to do this first. So can we? Uh, I started with this because of the active learning question. I want to finish boosting first. Uh, so that's a very interesting thing that uh, for now we're going to talk about it as a, as a way to measure things, right? Uh, especially in the sense of how this feature impacts our classifier. But then when we do support vector machines, margins are actually the objective. The objective of the support vector machine is written in terms of this margin. So for other algorithms, again, we're going to use margins as a way of analyzing them and figure out what's going on, more like a debugging tool. But for support vector machine, that's the explicit loss. So we'll see that, see that in, a, in a moment. For now, let's uh, go back to the idea of boosting. Uh, so we had two versions of boosting. I, I, I don't want to do the technical parts again rigorously. I just want to kind of uh, give you a quick summary so everybody's on the same page here. We have the other boost, right? That was saying what? There is this D uh, I or D P of X that's important. Dance of X at round D, right? This is distribution. There is the H D that's the classifier at round D. Right? That classifier has to measure its error in terms of the distribution, right? That's the whole point of the distribution. Points that are more important count more for the error. So the error at that round was something like the sum for all the data points, uh, it's HD of XI different than YI, right? That's the mistake, times the distribution for that point, right? So it says, you either make a mistake or not, one or zero. This is a predicate, it's one when you make a mistake. And that mistake doesn't count as one, counts as how much importance you give it. If the importance is very low, 
you can make a mistake, no big deal. Right? Then there was a coefficient that was the HD coefficients or weight. Like how, how good is that classifier? Uh, I think that was one half log of something. One minus epsilon divided by epsilon. I'm not sure this is it. You get to check the notes. We discussed a little bit what this coefficient is, and it makes total sense if you look at the proofs. Uh, it's not important for right now. It's just that every tree comes with a coefficient. And then I have the update, right? The next round distribution is dt times uh, an exponential form was e at minus alpha t if it's correct, and e at alpha t if it's incorrect. So that was a loop here. I'm missing, I'm missing some details around here, but that's the, the main loop of other versions. The other version of boosting that we had was saying, uh, well, um, let's, let's do it here. So this is like kind of gradient boosting. Uh, there's no distribution over points. What is updating at every round this other gradient, this other boosting version is what? What is changing with every round? And here, what's changing is the distribution over points. Some points become more important, the ones that I made mistakes on, and other ones become non-important because I already got them very right. Presumably, points that are already far away from classifications are the ones with small weights. I don't need to focus on those. And the ones that are still kind of hard to the hard patients or the hard emails or hard images, those will have high weights. So I'm focusing my algorithm on those. How about it here? What's changing here in gradient boosting? The labels are changing here, right? So I can say y uh, of x, that's a label, at round t is who? That's label at round t. So then I train my classifier. Uh, this classifier is trained for the data set, right? The features that I have, it's not changing. But the labels are now the labels at that round. Initially, of course, those labels are the original labels. And then how do I update? Maybe I have, a, again, a alpha t, some coefficient of hd. And then how do I update this thing? I have to update the labels. So what is the next label for a data point? previous label minus HD of X, maybe it's maybe minus alpha of X, I don't know, something like that. Right? So the idea is if you look if you look at the final classifier for both the final classifier is a summation of those H's that I train at each round. Those H's are called the weak letters. Most systems train weak learners that are very simple summation of, of uh, basic decision stumps, which are trees, all right? So you can imagine what you have here is a decision stump plus another decision stump. So I'm, I'm calling this alpha alpha coefficients of those trees. And each tree, it's a very simple one split and makes a prediction, that's it. Now both algorithms can train this model, but in a different way. This one changes the importance over the data points. This one, it changes the target labels. Every tree has to fit within this difference. And you can see why this is. If you eventually get a tree to fit very well the difference, maybe the last tree, when you add them all together, the result should be pretty close to the original label, right? If I start with the original label, say my salary is $100,000.
and then I trade the first three to predict salaries, I don't get 100,000 for, I'm an instance, I'm one of the excess, I get 90,000. The next three will say Virgil residual salaries from 100,000 that was the original target, minus 90,000 what's being predicted already is 10,000. Try to fit a tree in to get me that 10,000. Okay, that doesn't work perfect, that predicts 12,000 instead of 10. Then I train a tree now to predict minus 2,000 and so on and so forth. If eventually I get a tree to predict all those residuals correct, even if that's the 500 tree in the line, then if you add that back to all those numbers, I get the correct Ys, which are the, 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 you know, the salaries. We discussed this before, right? So that's the story with boosting. So what I'd like to do is to talk now a little bit about ranking. Ranking for machine learning is the kind of thing that could be your second course in machine learning, ranking, four months, okay? We don't have four months to do ranking, right? So the short story is we can't really do it. It's true. There's no way to fit in this course ranking because we would need you guys to finish the machine learning course and then spend another term doing ranking. But I want to give you an idea of what's possible and why it's important with the understanding that we can't do this for a homework. It makes sense for a project. At least one or two people want to do a project on ranking. If they succeed, we'll ask them to give us a little uh, demo or presentation to see how that works, right? Uh, it's important, especially if you have that sort of problem in industry. Like there are quite a few problems right now in industry that are definitely ranking problems, for which you can immediately see why the regression laws, square laws, or SVM laws doesn't work well. So you need the ranking approach to those problems. And that requires more math and more, more technical details. So but I want to give you two or three ideas about ranking. Again, we don't have a homework. You can make a project, or you can take another machine learning class with focusing on, on, on the ranking. Uh, so one of the ideas of ranking is based on this. One, another idea of ranking is based on this. And then yet we have another, maybe, idea of ranking. First of all, why is ranking so important? So an objective based on ranking has to do with the with the purpose of saying I don't want to predict black or white, sick or healthy, tiger versus not tiger. I don't want to predict the quantity like a salary, like a hundred thousand or hundred twenty thousand house prices or salaries, right? I want to predict an order. I want to predict is that better than that? Uh, why is this an issue? Like, why can't I use the quantifiers, classifiers like regression? gives me some scores, right? Can I use those scores to do ranking? Yeah. So instead of, instead of like, so suppose I want to predict movie recommendations or preferences between products or, or preferences between, say, Google has ranking of, of uh, web pages, right, for, for your query. So suppose I want to predict that ranking, right? Google doesn't care, doesn't show scores to people, right? This shows the ranking, like link number one, number two, number three, right? Obviously, Google wants to produce those in the order that you care about as a user. Why can't Google use a regression or some quantifier classifier, right? Like something for a quantity, gives everyone scores, and then just rank based on scores? Why is that not the easy thing to do? I mean, I have, if you're just like, let's say, searching a document, and all you care about is like frequency. You might have the issue where like two documents have the same relative frequencies, so you can't really tell them apart. It's like you're gonna get the same score. So how do you rank two things that are the same? Right, so so that's a I think slightly different issue. If two items are the same. Well not even the same, like you, they just happen to be the same by the way you're measuring them. So if if, if I have the same say features, right? for two data points, two documents, like he says. Um, it's hard to make different predictions, whether it's ranking or classification, right? It's very hard for any algorithm to take two things that are the same represented. Maybe not exactly the same document, but once I extract features, they look the same. They have the same frequency, say, right? Any algorithm will produce the same result, unless it's a random algorithm. So 
guy, right? That guy has some randomization point in it. So that's a different story. That's not what I mean by difficulty of ranking. That would be a different difficulty in classification too, right? If I have two patients and after I extract their features, they look identical, I can't really predict one is sick and one is healthy, right? My algorithm will make the same prediction of both of them. Why is ranking an issue? So why can't Google just take the, suppose I already extract features. I have this web documents, right, on Google. I already extracted whatever features I want to extract, word, frequency counts, page ranks, links, whatever. Then I say, okay, you want to rank those things? Train a regression classifier. Regression will produce scores, right, for every web page, and then rank by those scores. Easy bit. Um, I think like when we are considering the documents individually, we're not considering the fact that we have to rank them based on something like how relevant the document is to the user. So when we are we're using the boosting or ranking algorithm, so it will be comparing them with each other. So we'll be able to get a good so He's close, but he can't articulate technically what the problem is. That, that's like a, a story around that. If I am to train a regression, what do I need to feed in it? What rank that should be at? No, regression doesn't take that. If I train a regression, I take I take my features axis, right? Whatever I have from these web documents. But what should I give for the linear regression, not logistic regression, linear regression as a y? I have to give it some scores, right? Linear regression learns the house prices because in training data I have house prices. Learn salaries because in training data I have salaries. It can learn, I don't know, uh, amount of rain coming tomorrow because in training data there is raining measurements, right? Well, so if I want to do that, train a regression to predict the ranking of the scores, Let's predict some scores which I can use for rank. I should give it scores, right? So I don't have scores. Right? Even if I know the correct rankings for your query, for your query, for your query, I get everybody's queries, because I'm Google, I get billions of queries every day. And I can figure out a way to know what the correct ranking is, right? Maybe I measure people clicks, maybe I'll ask some people to explicitly tell me what documents are good. I collect some annotations that indicate what's a good ranking for a query. Maybe for a query I collect many people's preferences on ranking, right? So actually, by the way, Google does that. They, they actively try to get all the information that they can about whether you like the ranking they produce. You know, suppose you click on one document and you don't click on the second one. They'll immediately know that for that query, a person with your IP, in your location, da 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 da, did not click the second document. That's the information that's being stored so that algorithms can improve. Unfortunately, it's being stored whether you want to or not. That's a different story. Everything you do is being stored, right? So Google will try to collect ranking preferences. But if I collect the fact that I, Virgil, didn't click on the second, is everybody with me what I mean here? I type a query, right? President Trump, latest, uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get a bunch of rankings, right? Say. Google would know if I click on the second one, skip the third one, click on the fourth one, so on and so forth. They also know which ones are ads. So ads obviously have, have a different value of ranking. People ignore ads by default. But can I transform this to scores to fit my regression algorithm? And that's what I would need to do. I would have to take those ranking information, which is really, Virgil like that document better than that document, right? That, that's what it really means when I click on things. Or maybe I'm explicit, maybe there's a little checkbox there, Google, I really like that result, say, right? They have that in research mode. There's a checkbox that researchers or annotators can actually explicitly say, this is a good result for this query. You don't see that as a user, but they have it in, in internally, right? So then I can collect that. How do I make that into a regression score, which is what I need to train my regression function? That's a big problem. And then another problem is, are those scores, even if I transform this ranking into scores, are those scores comparable across queries, right? Suppose I come up with some scores for the query about Donald Trump, there's another query about a storm in, in Colorado, and there's uh, many, many other queries. Can I come up with a uniform space on this score so I can train my regression, right? Because in regression, you can't put scores on a different scales. The data has to, the scores have to be comparable. That's tough. How about a different example? 
when people rate Amazon products. It's slightly different than rating web pages, right? On web pages, the implicit rating is click, don't click. But this is a very noisy rating, right? Not everybody who doesn't click on a link means they don't like it. Not everybody who clicks on the link means the link is good. But if Amazon shows you a bunch of products and you buy one, that's a much stronger indication that you prefer that product to others, right? And then people rate those products, right? Four stars, five stars, one star. Can I use those stars as a regression target to say, okay, take those movies or those products, whatever it is, and train a regressor, and the target, the Y values, are those stars, one star, two star, three stars, in a quantity sense, right? Can I do that? Of course I can, technically. What's the problem with it? The distribution of the scores. Hmm? The distribution of the scores. Right, so that's a subtle problem. There's far more ones and fives than the middle ones. But there's a more obvious problem than that if I use product reviews or movies recommendation. Using one, two, three, four, five as quantitative scores that I can train a quantifier like a regressor to, to predict those scores. That's a problem that they, they come very skewed, but what's another problem? So, so four and five are on the same distance away from each other as two and three, because you're really working with a categorical. That's a, an important issue that the one, two, three, four, five in a quantitative sense, while everybody can agree one is more than two, two is more than three, three is more than four, so on and so forth, they actually as quantities misleading. Three is not halfway between two and four. Can you believe that? It, quantitatively it is, right? Three is two plus four divided by two. But when people rate the movie at three, they don't really mean I've got the same satisfaction as a two and a four divided by two. <laughs> People don't think that way. When they rate the latest, uh, you know, I don't know what they bought, screen or computer from Amazon, when they give it a four, they don't really mean I have half of the experience, you know, like a three and a five by half. So there's no, no quantitative, quantitative relationship. It's only an ordinal relationship. A four is less than a five, but it's not four-fifths of a five all the time. People have very weird, weird criteria for fours. So five, it's the easiest to map in, in common sense logic, not in mathematic logic, but in common sense logic, five is the best I've seen, right? That has to do with who you are, because the best you've seen is different than the best I've seen, the best that the best he's seen, so on and so forth. But five, at least for everybody, means that's the best you can hope for. One is like the worst you can ever imagine. But four and twos are really weird when people think about four and twos. There's a lot of user studies who try to figure out what's a four. Is it good, but could have been better? Or is it uh, the average thing that I get and uh, I was hoping for more? Or I don't know, you know? Fours and twos are the most weird. Three is easier to define in that sense. Three is like kind of the what I expected to do. Uh, I knew it's gonna be like that. Doesn't surprise me. It's not worse or better than four. But two and four are really, really difficult. What's another big issue with taking this as course? So one big issue, that's a small issue that has been said the first time. Second time, we have this issue as there's no quantitative relation between one, two, three, four, five. Right? Because four is not really halfway between three and five. What's another big issue? How do you rank things that are the same score? Like, if you have a bunch of fives, how do you order the fives? Uh, I think that's not a big issue, but it is an issue in the sense of we just assume all fives are the same. If they're all web links or they're all like, you know, computers or they're all like things you buy, any one of them is equally good. So we have a class of fives or a class of threes. Within that class, pick one. What's a big issue? Getting a five with, or getting a thousand fives is very different than getting one five. So you just do the average, then you're not really taking into account frequency, also there's papers. I think you mean something like a user experience in here, you know, what, what's the damage of getting, the example is maybe, let me fix it a little bit. Is it better to get one five and many fours? No, I was, or I was getting the size of the data set. Right? All the students, this has been three. mentioned that it's very skewed from one five, but I thought you mean, uh, if you get 10 things, is it better to get three fives and seven twos, or one five and nine fours. Which one is better? 
hard to tell, right? If you, if you, if you look at a set of products you buy or set of web, because it's not just one query with one set of links or one product. We're buying and looking at results all the time, or we rank patients or, or car preferences, right? So in order to, to look at a set of these rankings, how preferable is one five? How much willing are you willing to drop the other ones to get one more five? It's hard to tell. But I had in mind a different thing. That's a big issue. So, so far, only one big issue has been listed. The fact that three is not halfway between two and four. There's another big issue. What about pay gradients? Uh, that's a small issue. Uh, fake ratings versus uh, noise in the house prices, right? Fake ratings, at least adversarial ratings, we don't deal with that. That's a different machine learning. But noise ratings, uh, somebody puts a four, but it should have been a three. It's reasonable to assume some people are confused between three and four, they put the wrong one. How about the house price that's $150,000? I, I see this as $170,000. It's the same kind of noise. Do I have the same ability to deal with it? Uh, in ordinal preferences, it's actually easier to deal with noise than in, in actual target quantitative scores. But I have in mind a different problem. So it has to deal with like my scale of one to five for a particular product that's different than so like right. you're assuming the user. Right. That's the second big issue, which is we we can all be easily consistent in preferences. I could say I like this better than that, and if you say the same, you agree with me. But we cannot agree on the actual ratings. If I write if I if I buy two computers, I rate one a three and one a four, the four one is better than the three. And you might rate it also like a five and a three or a four and a three, which means you agree that computer, the second one, is better than the first one. So it's been shown over and over again that people that agree on preferences, which one is better, they actually truly agree on the product. But it's also shown that people don't agree on the actual scale. Like, although we agree which computer is better, the ratings will be different. And that's the same for airline companies. Uh, that's the same for car models. That's the same for uh, class preferences. You know, if you ask people which courses do you like, most people agree that course is better than that course. But if you ask them to rank, to rate them, to, to rate them one, two, three, four, five, or one to ten, you'll get different ratings for these classes. So that's another big problem in transforming these preferences into scores. That I can get the consistency on which one's better than which but I can't get exact consistency on what the score means because, again, like before, four and five and threes are not well defined. What is a four? It's only lower than a five and bigger than a three, but I, I don't have a, a consistent definition, right? Does like taking an average of all the user ratings help this in any way? Because you can assume that people have different preferences, but like they might be they might be able to like bucket the kinds of right. It, it helps. Uh, I I I I think. What you're asking is, is helping what quantitative sense? I don't think so. I'm not sure about that answer. Like, if I take all the ratings of a particular product, that's what Amazon does, right? They give you three stars and a half. Yeah. That's the average rating, right? Uh, and then I, I think you can work with these stars, but as far as I know, for even for averages like recommendation systems, um, people tend to model the preferences, not the 3.5. As a, as a score, and also um, in collaborative filtering, when it's usually the average being done, you would have a lot of different users having different reasons to put ratings. So Amazon and Netflix break down into user classes those ratings. But I, I think the score may be more meaningful as a 3.5. That's what we do as a as a bias, right? When you look at Amazon, you look there at those yellow stars, and if you see, you want to see a lot of them first of all, right? You ignore if it's one or two or three, because it's random people who put the numbers. But but if it's like 3,000 stars, 3,000 reviews, that means the average has a large base of averaging, right? And then when you see something with four and a half, that's a pretty good indication that it's a safe thing to buy, right? That if you're buying that thing, is a, I don't know, a computer screen is not going to die on you because 3,000 other people like it. So I think in that sense, a safety of, of me purchasing the thing, like I don't want to buy something that nobody else looked at, the averaging a lot of reviews, it's useful. But I don't think it helps as a quantitative 
target in a, in a quantifier. Now, so that's the story, right? Ranking, and then we can expand to Spotify. There's so many ranking problems. So now, back to machine learning. How do we do that? If I have ranking problems, whether they are uh, web pages, or cars, or songs, or books, or, or some other preferences. Uh, by the way, there's a, a something in geometry very, very, uh, very important these days that has to do with if I have preferences but no exact. So my if I don't have an X matrix of data points, but I have preferences, I know he as a student is more like him than like her. More by somebody figured that out, right? So that, that's a lot to do with people and say, I can say that this patient is similar with this patient, but not as similar with this other patient. But I don't have actual features. I don't have, you know, say blood pressure and all that. How do I deal with this ranking problem? That, that's some problem in geometry that is not machine learning, but it's being studied right now. So if I have ranking problems, how can I take, say, this algorithm and deal with it? Or maybe this algorithm? or maybe regression or neural network, something that we've studied that has these targets which are either categories, zero, one, or quantities like home prices. How can I take the and make them work with ranking? That's what it may take for more months to do. But I want to give you an idea, right? So in here, how can I do this? You looked at the Rhinos paper, or you have an idea? <laughs> Somebody who didn't look at the Rhinos paper. So how do I look at this? Again, what is this doing? In importance for each point. Train my classifier. Figure out a weight for that classifier or a coefficient. That's just this coefficient in front of me right here. Right? And then update the distribution. Make the points that you're wrong more important next round. Can I take this idea and apply it to ranking? Uh, not technically, I'm just saying, what's the idea? How do I take this and apply it to ranking? You are excluded from this question if you looked at the rank paper, because that, that, that's the idea, right? Is it just using alpha t for different ranking? To rank so alpha will stay. It's a coefficient of the weak learner which is going to be some sort of tree, very basic. In, in here, remember, we want the weak learners to be weak. We don't want to train complex classifier in postings. We want every one of those, whether it's a decision stamp or something else, to be a simple classifier. Alpha will stay. No, I mean, uh, once you, you predict something and then they use the weightage of that, so that it gives you a different number. Right. I'm going to have a distribution. Still, I'm going to have a classifier. I'm going to have a coefficient. And I'm going to update that distribution. So the main mechanism stays. But I need to do something to make it work for ranking. That's what my point is. I want to keep that kind of flavor of this mechanism, but for ranking purposes, not for straight target. What will the classifier output? Will it be a rank or a regress code? The 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 all classifier at the very end? The individual as well and at the end as well. So say I'm open to to change like either way, right? I think I can, I can, uh, I can um, obtain a ranking, or the, a ranking as a whole is hard to produce, right? You cannot expect to produce a full ranking, or all the possible rankings of, say, a thousand items, a thousand factorial, right, permutations. You cannot hope to produce all these thousand factorial permutations, but maybe you can at least produce something like that is better than that. This is a partial ranking, right? If I tell you I want to rank all the students here, I can't give you a full ranking, but I can say that's better than him, her, it's better than you know, this other student, so on and so forth. So I'll give you a bunch of pairs or triplets. Perhaps you can put a whole ranking together out of that. You need a heuristic there, right? You know so what I'm saying? You can break a ranking into partial parts, right? Say, okay, this is my ranking. This is item one, item two, item three, up to item 100. Instead of writing the ranking this way, you can just say, well, item one is better than item two, 
item two is better than item three, up to item 99 is better than item 100. And now those are partial ordinal constraints, how they call. Ordinal constraints means it's a constraint on ranking without scores. And if you have those and there's no conflict, there's no cycle in those rankings, right? Then you can probably rank the whole thing by these constraints, right? If you have enough of those, you can be quite sure what the ranking is. So by, by when you say, what am I producing? I don't have to produce the full ranking. I actually have to produce some partial, this is better than this, and so on and so forth, enough to produce a ranking if I want. Or I can produce a score and rank by that score. I mean, that, that's totally valid, right? Although, although we don't know how to train a regressor, if an algorithm produces a score, I can rank by that score. And then that's a ranking. I mean, we have to see if it's good or not. Is the uh, importance criteria uh, to rank it in a way, uh, how important. Uh, so we make the mistakes important. Right, so what's a mistake? I, I, I think, I'm not sure you're going somewhere with this or not, but let's say he, you do. So, uh, <laughs> right, right? What, what, in terms of ranking, when do I say my classifier makes a mistake? What's a mistake? If my information is ranking, I don't have sick versus not sick in here. I don't have uh, house prices. When is, what is a mistake? Rating in rank. Hmm? Rating Rating in rank. Of what? Trish. Predicting the whole, the whole permutation of 100 things being incorrect. Of course, that's a mistake, but it's hard to look at the ranking of uh, many things and say you have a mistake. I mean, maybe you have a mistake, but if all of them is in order except one little thingy. Are you going to call that the same mistake as if everything is messed up? So you count by inversions, like how far away it is from where it should be. Right. So you want to break this ranking loss or, 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 or uh, goal that what I want into little ranking problems. Get all the pairs in order. And then what's a mistake? A mistake is now. I want to move away from h t of x is not y. I want to say h of x i and x j. So I'm going to predict something for a pair. That's two two objects, two web links, or two people, or two you know movies, whatever it is that I'm ranking. I want to say that's incorrect. Of course, what's the possibility for x i and x j? It's the two movies. They either in correct order or incorrect order, right, in the ranking, because it's either one way or the other. So this is still a binary classifier like we did originally for adapters, right? Every pair, it's either correct or incorrect. So that's the magic here. We would like to rewrite this with the objects being pairs, not data points. And then the distribution of things that you get correct or incorrect will have to be over what? This dt. The, the, the pairs, right? So if I do that, dt is a thing over pairs. ht is a thing over pairs. That's either, say, it's going to predict what? Either 1 when xi is bigger than xj. Uh, or minus one when xj is bigger than x, something like this, right? H would be a, some sort of classifier that says who is ranked first. Is xi higher than xj or xj higher than xi, right? Alpha t, maybe same like before. There's some computation of how al alpha t is just a coefficient of the error. So whatever the error is, I can use the same formula or something very similar. It's just a calculation. And how do I update this? Update rule here. DT.
So because of this update, I'm cutting this, and I'm saying I still want HT of XT to be kind of the score or the classification. Uh, well, so, so somebody might say, okay, well, that makes sense to me, right? This five minutes ago, why you cut it, right? Uh, I'm saying mathematically and algorithmically, I would really like a function when I train my classifier to train it on actual instances, right? That, that's what I know how to do. I don't know how to train a decision tree on pairs, right? And can I, can I go this way? If I get something that approaches scores, can I obtain a ranking of the pairs? Yeah, I just said that, right? If I get some scores, I can rank them by the score. So I still would like to train a classifier over instances that will produce some scores, but then what type of scores? How do I train that? So that's where we get into the weeds of how this works. Now, if I manage to do that part to the classifier, HD, the distribution is perhaps manageable, right? Because the distribution, if I have, uh, I don't know, 40,000 data points, it will be this distribution is of what, what space? N square, right? Uh, pairs, order of N square pairs. So, even if I manage the classifier to be on the original data space, aka movies, uh, this would be potentially a very large space if I have, like I said, 40,000 movies or 100,000 movies. This D, what's 100,000 square? 10 to the 10, 10 billion. Right. So we gotta be, this would be a problem, but even if I manage this, this may be a huge data structure in itself if it's on all pairs of data, right? So that, that's a question of how many data points can I deal with if I impose this n squared matrix of uh, Imagine updating this at every round and this is 10 billion cells that need updating. That, that could be quite tough. So this algorithm here, it's called Rainbow's. It works kind of like this. I won't go into details of how to set up HD. You'll have to read the paper. What I want you to know is that it's the same mechanism as it here, except the importance is on pairs. The classifier is still on X's, and the distribution needs to be updated on pairs. And you have to know one more thing. There is a particular case of this Well, all the labels y of x, it's either 0 or 1 in the following sense. Ones have to be ranked higher than so this is not the binary classification problem. I'm not trying to predict every data point comes with a one and a zero, like before, binary. But I'm not trying to predict the ones and zeros. I'm trying to rank the ones and zeros. There's a difference here, right? Um, if I can get classification to work perfectly, of course, ranking will be perfect too. If I can get every one a zero to be predicted as a zero and every one a one predicted as a one, I'll also get the ranking correct. But I could rank s still s things correctly without doing the binary classification problem. So this is, the, this is coming from information retrieval, this particular problem. This is the issue of what links, uh, what results are good in the search engines or not good. Clicked or not clicked. With the understanding that everything that's good or clicked on, it's equally good. So among the ones that are good links, they all, equally good, it doesn't matter how we rank them, so that's another thing. One versus one, or zero versus zero, those don't have to be ranked. In other words, 
for the purpose of ranking, it doesn't matter if you swap the ones among themselves. It doesn't matter if you swap the zeros among themselves. All you want is to have a ranking that looks like one, 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 zero, 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 zero. Right? So for those are the uh, IR Google results, right? And this is a good one, good one, good one, good one, bad one, bad one, bad one, bad one. Well, this is saying it doesn't matter how Google ranked those in what order they put them here. It doesn't matter how it ranked those. What matters is you want to have those on top of zeros. So that's, this setup comes from information retrieval. Because originally, before uh, roughly these things have changed about five years ago in information retrieval, like set changes. But before that, most of the retrieval problems, people not working anymore for, for, of optimizing rankings, by the way. So that's this whole rush that was for 20 years in how to get better rankings. People write a lot of search engines. There was a lot of pressure on Bing to produce equally good results as Google. No one cares about that anymore because it's done in a different way now. But back then, it was understood that users don't have other preferences than zero and ones. Most of the queries people put, they either the answer is there or it's not there. So maybe it matters readability. I get the answer, it's in a small paragraph or it's in a like, gigantic mess that I have to go through. That was an issue. But other than that, there was no intermediate value for web links, was whether the answer is there or not. So in here, if this is the setup, if you want to rank a class versus another class and you don't care inside each class what the ranking is, then rank boost can be made very efficient. So it's not in general for ranking problems. It's in this case when the target is black and white and all the whites have to be before the black. Now, how is that? How it does that? Again, magic. I'm not going to go into the details. It takes that distribution that's on pair xi xj and it writes it down as a function of xi times the same function of xj. So it turns out that in this case the distribution can factorize into individual distributions per item. And updating the distribution like in the original Adabus paper, because in the original Adabus paper, this is a distribution over items here. Then I can get the product to work. So I don't really need a table of n squared things if I can factorize it into a product. But in general, I can't do this because in general the problems are not simple. Rank all the ones above all the zeros. But if that's my setup, I can do rank with the mission. There's another efficiency uh, that's one and then two, uh, the search for weak learner. That is H of T, HT can be quick. So the second part of the Rangus paper, which is not hard. This is not, uh, I'm not doing the details because they're not, not because they're super hard, but just because uh, I can't give you homework about this, and so it requires some independent study. But if you care about this, you can easily see how this is called the BPAC type case. That's from graph theory, BPAC type. So you can see both those details in the paper, why in this case you can factorize the distribution and do the search for the decision stump very quickly. So people have done that and they have pretty good results of rank boost. Again, mostly in this bipartite setup. So that's one idea of ranking. If you implement other boost, there's an extra credit problem there, implement rank boost. So you have to go to this paper, talk to me. I have some PhD students which are expert as boosting, so you can talk to them too and get it to work on a ranking. I can also give you a ranking data set. I can give you a data set coming from information retrieval exactly like this. When there's documents, there is queries, and every document is labeled one or zero, good or no good for that query, and the task is to rank all the ones above all the zeros. You should also know that information retrieval uses different measures than standard classification. Because in ranking, it doesn't make much sense to use accuracy, for example. If you have 
two relevant documents within 10 billion. Accuracy, just predicting everything at zero would be 99.99999, right? So they have very specific metrics there for how ranking works. Uh, I think we talked about one, which was the number of inversions that's also used in, in combinatorics. But they have very specific information triple measures. Some of you may have heard of NDCG. You took IR? Anybody took IR? If you took IR, you must have heard of NDCG, <coughs> right? Uh, what it stands for? Normalized, <laughs> discounted, CG, cumulative gain. This is a measure, by the way, everybody's using. For whatever reason, Microsoft came up with it. Some people in Finland working for Microsoft, and since then everybody's using NBCG for ranking. So if you take an R course, you have to, you know, you sooner or later you're going to need that. So then the optimization is not for a square loss or for accuracy or for F1. It's for specific ranking metrics. Okay, so we've done that. What else can we do for ranking? How about taking some ideas from gradient boosting? By the way, the word gradient I don't know if it was clear when we talked about gradient boosting before, comes from the fact that this is actually a gradient descent update formula. The, this here, and it's actually the differential of the loss. For a very specific loss, the square loss, this is a gradient descent uh, update formula, if you look at the gradient descent nodes. So you can do it for any loss. This is, I did it for this loss because it's very intuitive why we call this a residual label. You can see here in here that if I, this is YT right here. If I take well, my predictor is out of the target and I'm trying to fit that, eventually I'm gonna predict the label correctly. But you, you can apply different losses here, and you take the gradient, and you can have a date formula for any loss you choose. So this, the name gradient is uh, boosting, comes from the fact that the update is a gradient formulation. So how can we apply that idea now for ranking? So if the, the one in the top doesn't have any difference from the one in the bottom, how is it different from clustering? Like, well, when we cluster, we don't guarantee to get the ones and zeros together, right? I mean, in clustering, you don't have labels. I mean, let's say classification. How is it different from setting them apart? Here is ones, here is zeros. Right, so I, 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 I said that, I think, 10 minutes ago. If classification works perfectly, uh -huh. I could get the, the classification scores one and zero, and just predict the ranking, right? right? But there are many reasons for which classification won't work well when I can actually produce a good ranking. So here's another idea, and this idea originated from many places. The, the first idea I show you this rank was clearly originated from information retrieval, 100%. But there's another idea that says, if I associate S of X, I, some score for X, I. That's kind of what I wanted to do. Remember when I say I want to train a regressor to give me scores, and I want to rank by those scores, right? And S, J, of course, is the score for X, J. I would like to train those scores. That's what I want, but I want to, uh, kind of map those scores into a probability in logistic regression. What do we do with the scores? How do we make the scores into a classification problem? No. Uh, we can do that thresholding, but that would be linear regression threshold. I mean logistic regression. We, we apply the sigmoid, right? I want something like the sigmoid. I want to say, well, I want to take those scores and make some sort of probability that xi is better than xj. Better, this is the ranking. Right? This is what I actually have. My targets, my objective, don't come with scores. Like I said, I don't have home prices. I only have this is better than that. 
So how can I transform scores into probabilities of being ranked? I need some sort of formula that's like the logistic regression formula, but it doesn't transform a score into a probability of being black or white. It transforms two scores into a probability of one being better than the other. formula here. One over, very similar, E at some constant beta Si minus Sj. So this is very similar to the logistic function. It transforms a score, which is the difference into a probability. So what happens if the, if the scores are equal, SI equal to SJ? I get 0.5, right? Makes sense? If the scores are equal, what's the chance of one being better than the other? If SI is a lot bigger than SJ, should be the other way? Well, it depends what you mean by bigger or higher. Like depend how you sort those losses. If the, if the high rank corresponds to low scores, if you sort in ascending order, then an SI that is big will end up with the probability of being very low, right? So that, that makes sense if the scores, uh, high scores correspond to low ranks. And if I want it backwards, I do SJ minus SI in the end, right? The other difference. And what does beta controls? Like, you know, just regression? The steepness of this curve, how, how quickly a difference changes the probability. Now, that's still fake. Just like the logistic regression, it's a fake probability. If you get there a probability of 75%, does it mean that really three quarters of the items with that sort of different scores are better ranked? No, it's just the way this mathematical model works. So if I can get something like this, uh, this originated, one place it originated in was in the way the, the tournament works, like the ATP tournament, the tennis tournaments, or the chess master rating, the like people who play chess. There, is a, there are two sides of both kind of scoring. There's two sides. One side is given the current scores, as you probably know, tournament players have a year score, like tennis scores. If you look at ATP rankings, there's a current score of that player. It has to do with how many times he won and what kind of level. Same thing for chess players. They have a yearly score that accumulates. And at the end, whoever has the biggest number of points that year, that, that's the best player of the year, or something like that. There's two sides of this problem. One is, given the current scores, what's the chance that one player will beat the other? That is this, what this formula is trying to say. If I, if I do take two tennis players and I look at their scores, I want to predict or compute the probability that the better player, the player with higher score, will beat the lower player. But that's not 100%, right? The, the, in tennis or chess, it's not guaranteed that the player who has more points necessarily is going to win. But there's a mapping in what's the probability of that to happen. In chess, it's the same thing. The player that has the high rating or score is not guaranteed to beat the player with a lower rating, but it's more likely, more than 50 50 chances. So that's one side. The other side is how those scores need to get updated. Once the game happened, we know the outcome. Either the better player beat the weaker player, or the weaker player beat the better player. In either case, we want to update both scores. Of course, if a weak player beats a better player, we want to update, make a bigger update, right? That, that's kind of a more, more important event than the event goes as expected when the big better player beats the weaker player. That if, if the best player in the world, which has like a million points, beats the worst player in the world, which has like zero points, we probably don't need to update anything, right? Because the points reflect reality. So there's no need for an update. But if the worst player beats the best player, then it means we need to make huge updates. Perhaps the worst player is actually not a bad player at all. 
So how can I, based on this, create some branching out machinery now? I mean, can, can I do something like this? Take derivatives, <coughs> uh, update the scores. So I have some feedback, right? This probability, this is predicted, right? From model, from S model. Uh, S is my scoring model. So I have, based on my scores, I have a prediction of who's going to be who. But I can compare this prediction against the ground truth, right? Remember, the ground truth, my, my training data doesn't come with, with, with target scores like home prices. What it comes to it, I know in the ground truth whether it's, it's indeed better than xj, right? So I can compare this versus the truth xi is better than xj. That's similar to logistic regression, right? Logistic regression process the probability of something being, say, 1. And then I can look at the training set and see is that 1 or 0. And if the probability, so suppose it's a 1 in, in the training set. If this probability is close to 100%, then my model does well, right? It predicts 100% on a point that's 1. If it predicts backwards, then I make an update based on gradient descent, right? So I would like to compare my coming probabilities against the truth. And from this comparison, do an update of the scores. That's what I want to do. Similar with how gradient descent work for logistic regression, right? What do I do? I take my scores, I map them to a probability. What was the loss in logistic regression? How did I compare probabilities coming from my model with the truth in the training set? Cross entropy. Right? So I use a cross entropy loss. Maybe I can use the same cross entropy loss here. You know, so I have cross entropy. Requires derivatives. And then I have to get the same way. Remember how we, we, the differential in logistic regression had to differentiate twice was the logistic function first, and then has to differentiate the linear function, which is SI could be a linear function, right? Maybe S is really sum of W times xi. This is a regressor. So my scoring function, maybe it's a regression function. I follow logistic regression. But instead of mapping a score into a probability, I map two scores into a probability. And then I compare that probability with the ground truth, which is either I got in the wrong way or the, the right way. And then I have to redo the differentials to update the scores. Would that work? Should work, right? So uh, this, or another option would be to make S a neural network. Right? Those kind of functions, logistic function or this differential function here, or softmax, work quite well when the base function is a linear model. So if I use this and this update, I'm going to skip the differentials part. I get something called uh, rank net. You can see why. If I use a, a neural network as the base scoring function, and I apply this formula or something that translates difference in two scores into a probability, and then I apply the that that's now that becomes a ranking loss because even if I use cross entropy, the probability is computed for a pair. Then I call that rank. How about if I do differentials, but I apply a method like this? So, in here, remember the update is still based on a gradient, but the idea here, what's the difference between this and a neural network? A neural network has a gradient descent base update on the feature weights. Right? And it changes those weights. A boosting, it, it does the same. It computes a gradient on the labels, though. The gradient in the boosting algorithm is not on the feature weights. It's on the 
on the y's, right? So it doesn't update the coefficients on the feature weights like a regression, like a regression or a neural network model. It updates the labels. And then what does it do the next round? Instead of changing the weights and producing different weights, it leaves the existing model the same, and it does what? Adds one more tree to it. This addition of trees, we call it ensemble, right? There's a more fancy name. It's called MART. Anybody wants to take a guess what that means? This is addition. This is regression. This is tree. Multiple. 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 Not random. This R is not random. I know there's something called random forests. We can discuss that on the side of office hours if you're curious about it. But that's R is not random forest here. It's tempted to say because it's trees, right? So a tree is a forest and. Uh, no, R means regression. So remember when we talked about regression trees? Yeah. We split the tree, but the objective was what? When we, we split the tree, we ended up with the quantities in those leaves. And when we predicted if we decide to stop the split, was kind of the average in that quantity. And the main drive was the variance, meaning decrease the variance. That makes sense in here if I have scores, right? So I could, I could see how these trees work on scores which are quantitative in nature, and then those quantities get mapped into probabilities. So my point is, a, a ranking formulation like this from scores into pairs can either go to a neural network and follow the neural network kitchen uh, engineering, which results in something called RankNet, or can go to a gradient boosting procedure that updates not the feature weights, but the labels and adds more to the model. If I go this, I get RankNet. If I get this one here, I end up with lambda mark. So there's another arrow here that uses gradient on labels. That's lambda mark. So the ideas that I want to mention to you are three. I could take this method, boosting, and apply it on pairs and change the weights on pairs. Or I can take the logistic regression idea, make the scores into a ranking probability compared to the ground truth, and depending how I'm updating my score models, if I go through a neural network sort of update, I get the algorithm called RankNet. If I get to the gradient boosting sort of updates, which is on labels, I get, this is really boosting, what we called boosting before, because that's what we have, multiple additive regression trees or classification trees, but for here, in here is regression. Lambda is, has to do with those, uh, that's how they call the updates in there. So like I said, we don't have time to do this properly. I know that, but I just want to give you three ideas for how you can take some of the existing methods and apply no ranking. Some people mentioned they want to do ranking projects, like implement those and running on data. That would be extremely appropriate for this class if you want to do more on ranking. So for those people, we can discuss more. We look at the data. Now, of course, we didn't get to homework five yet. But we do have wow, eight minutes. Yeah. So I want to talk for a little bit of something that has been asked, missing values. How do I deal with missing values in data? So I think that's the, I don't have time to go into features and margins, but I could talk about homework five. There's no big science about missing values, OK? But we need some good ideas, good heuristics to go by. So there is a little note uh, in there that talks about missing values. I'm not sure it's available or not. I may have to sound it on the website. But it talks about how to think of missing values in the context of certain algorithms. So one idea is on. Uh, Sometimes it's, it's not easy to deal with missing values, except, especially if there's a lot of them. So what do I do for naive Bayes? 
that's not in the homework, but I can think about. If I have nine missing values in my base, what do I do? What do I do in a decision tree? What do I do if I do regression? If I have missing values. What would be good ideas? Yes. In my base, can you make a dummy variable for missing values because they still might provide information? Uh, I think that's a good idea, but not for naive base. I think that's a, maybe a reasonable idea for a decision tree. Let's start from there, right? So I have a decision tree, right? I have a split, any split, right? And uh, suppose I already trained the tree. Because there's two kinds of missing values, missing value and training set, missing values and testing set. In testing, suppose this uses feature number three here to do a split, right? My, my data point, the testing, I'm in testing mode now, doesn't have that value, feature three. What do I do? Go with the majority. Huh? Majority. Whichever side has more. So I can go majority, it says I don't have this value, right? What you were saying? Go both ways and see if it's value at the right answer. Well, that's a testing, so I don't know the correct answer, right? I'm in a test mode, I have to predict something, how do I know the answer? But I like your thinking. Average. Can I go, go in both ways, ways average somehow? Average. I don't like the average, but I like going both ways. So there's a version of trees that's probabilistic trees that allows you to go both ways. In the same way EM has a probabilistic e, uh, k-means flavor, right? Any, any data point is not strictly in one cluster. You could two different properties be different clusters. The same way, I can say in a tree, you don't go 100% somewhere. You go 80%, 20%, and those properties propagate all the way down. That's complicated engineering, but it sounds very plausible as a probabilistic tree. So I can go to majority, I can go both ways, or what you said earlier, how about I have another branch here, which is missing. missing. Would that only work if you have lots of missing data in your training set? If that, if he's right. If I don't have any missing data on the training set, I can't create a missing branch because I wouldn't know how to train it. But that's a good problem to have, right? Yes. I, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have... Uh, so if I only have few missing data points, it's not a big deal. If I only have in the few in the testing set and nothing in the training, that's a data shift problem. Something has changed, right? If I see a lot of missing values for some, say, blood pressure in the testing data, which I didn't have the training, clearly I don't get the same data. Like how out of a sudden blood pressure is missing, right? So data shifts are always problematic for algorithms. But the most common case is this value is missing in 30% of the data, which is an issue, but it's equally likely training versus testing. And therefore, I can hope to have enough missing values in training to train that branch too. So that's all the training problem. Shouldn't you have that at each node? Right. Because you can't tell. If there is an issue with missing data, I need to have it everywhere where I use a feature with missing values. OK? So that's some heuristic for what to do with the decision tree. How about in naive base? How do you just take the mean since it's not? In naive base, remember when we do P of X given Y, that's after the base formula. What P of X1 given Y times P of X2 given Y times P of XD given Y, right? That's that's calculating the wrong conditional. We actually need the other conditional, so we need to reverse the base formula to get the conditional within. Why in here is not really a conditional? Because it's only within the plus side, right? So that applies as a training for all the points that have you know, the same thing. How do I deal here with the fact that, say, x1 is missing? I don't so, have the x1 value. So the probability of 1, ignore it? Ignore it. Is that the same thing as ignoring it? Uh, no, because it depends on the distribution of the feature itself. Right. I think marginalization is the same as ignoring it, but maybe I'm wrong. Like, I think what not putting it, or make it a one, 
I think it's actually marginalizing all the po all possible values of x1. In other words, if I don't have x1, this formula will become sum over all x1 equal x values of probability of x even y there, so say a, times probability of x2 even y times probability of x d even y. So if x1 missing, this is a marginalization. You say you got to sum up over all possible values of that feature because you don't know which one is it. So it ends up being a sum, but the sum is one. So it's like missing here. And that's actually not a problem in naive base, assuming you don't have a lot of missing values. If you have a lot of missing values, maybe they, they might have information, right? Like if you have a rocket launch and you have like the last sensory that is missing, then probably the rocket exploded. Right, but that's it. not missing in the sense we talk here about missing. Missing then is not missing. It's actually a value that, that means something. So in that sense, missing is just another value that you need to account for. We mean missing or something like we don't know what's going on. It's, it, there is a value, but we don't know which one it is. You're talking about missing, which is its own category value. Yeah. Well, why, why not treat missing as its own category value also? Right. We can do that, but there's a difference between missing as in zero, like there's there's not there and missing as if there is a value we don't know it. It's not the same thing. Right. So it's one thing to say we know missing it's one of the options, and we treat it as a zero, for example, versus we know there is a value, it's not zero, but we don't have it. So we can't really use it. All right. There's some notes about this if you want to follow the summation. How about in here? I have a regression, right? And it's missing, like x3 is missing. I can't really compute this dot product, right? Because I don't have x3. This is literally w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 plus w3 times what? I can't really compute this value if I don't have an x3. I can compute an average x3, average x3 over all data, right? I can do that. What else can I do? So average clearly works in a quantifier because the, the nature of the sum being a long sum, if I replace that with the average or default, so the other option is default some features that I don't know might have a natural default value. What's the age of incoming students? Even if somebody doesn't complete their age, I can assume the default age is 18 years old, right, for under minutes. Default is more like data field. Well, I can maybe do something with regularization. That's more like a question for you guys to think about. Can I use the regularization L2 and L1 to do something with the missing value? Can I somehow look at the coefficients? Or maybe let's put two things here, regularization and feature correlation. In other words, if x3 is very related to x5, suppose I know that somehow, with say some covariance matrix analysis. I don't have x3, but I have x5. Can I do something with x5 coefficient to, to work it out? Suppose x3 is related to x5, x7, and x11, three features. And I'm missing x3, but I have the other three features. Can, can I somehow use those coefficients with some regularization to put it in? Maybe. All right. So that's what I have. We're now in full swing on, on uh, homework five. So you should have everything you need to do that. And next week, we will have to talk about margins and features. So one of the things that's coming next week is not the machine learning part, but how do you get features out of raw data? So everything so far, more or less, has been data given to me in feature form. Right? Now I'm going to give you real text or real images and say, 
We don't have a matrix of features, you just have pieces of You're going to have to extract the words yourself, counts, images, image features, so on and so forth. So, actually, that is what's going on more in machine learning today. How do you obtain with features more than how to optimize algorithms? And uh, I'll, I'll be at office hours today, but I may have to leave at 7.30 or so. So if you need to see me, please come 7 the latest. Uh, for the homework, you should be first. Generally, it doesn't make sense to run in no, you have to build three one by one. So that each 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 component can be just But in reality you can use any learning. I don't have the data set yet. I'm gonna to try to find it by the office hours, but I can't promise. I look at I have many archives at home and I don't know which one is. I have it for sure. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can find it by the way. Uh, that's, um, the actual discounting and 